So I think the point that Harold is making is, is, is worth noting. Uh, the concept of precision medicine has been here for a long time. I think what defines the era that we are now in is that uh, thanks to the capacity that we have to look at the multiple mutations that are present in any tumor at the same time, we have a full picture of the mutational landscape of all these tumors. So until now, I would say that you had a new mutation and a new target maybe once every few years. So Herceptin being the example. Herceptin was launched in 2001. Uh, Glivec was launched at about the same time. So every few years we had a breakthrough. All of a sudden, uh, thanks to the efforts of the DGGA and others, we have the whole set, if you wish, of more prevalent uh, uh, mutations that are drivers of cancers that we know that they play a role and that we can target them because many of them are, as you said, they're tyrosine kinase inhibitors and there are other um, molecules that we can devise drugs to, to work against those. So the landscape today is that we have a number of genes, uh, the number to be discussed, it could be 200, it could be 400, that we can routinely sequence in our laboratories. And that is the concept behind our Center for Molecular Oncology, the Krabi Center that we just built. And in our case, we are sequencing 12,000 tumors per year. And these are all the patients that have advanced disease and that we think that they might potentially benefit from some of these therapies because they can either be part of clinical trials. So now we have a panel of genes that clearly drive tumor growth, and we have therapies that we can use. So we launch the sequencing effort, uh, uh, we get the reports, the reports go into the chart, and at the same time, we open up a huge clinical trial program in which we have, uh, at any given time, 700 clinical trials, uh, and many of them are um, what we call basket trials, in which we, instead of just uh, targeting one disease type, we target a specific gene. You have genes that are mutant, and then you can define uh, the study population, the patients that will be participating in these trials based on these particular gene mutations. And we can make fantastic advances um, much faster than we would ever do, because we are treating rare tumor types that we could never ever launch a clinical trial. Uh, because there are not enough patients for that. Uh, so, for example, we have trials against BRAF, and BRAF is mutant in melanoma in 40%, but it's also mutant uh, in 2% of many tumor types. And then you can address the question, uh, do BRAF inhibitors uh, are active against these mutations in different types? So, um, going to breast cancer, uh, if you look at the number of actionable mutations that are present in breast cancer, PI3 kinase, AKT, RB2, et cetera, ER itself, about 68% of tumor cancers have mutations that we can target. Uh, lung cancer, you have ALK, you have EGF receptor, you have ROS. We have others that we cannot target, unfortunately, like SKRAS and others. But so now we have a first wave of clinical trials addressing the low-hanging foods, which are going to be the driver mutations that we can target. Now, this is going to be far more complex because rarely a tumor will be driven by just one mutation. So we need to pay a lot of effort about uh, using right combinations. So we're working on that. So we need to launch a number of smart hypothesis-driven combination trials. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that the tumors under selective pressure when it's the same as, the, uh, as with antibiotics in infection disease. If you treat uh, a given infection and you don't cure that infection, eventually those, that infection will become refractory to the antibiotic because it develops resistance. So tumors do develop resistance over time, and it, they are evolving. They evolved under selective pressure. So one thing that we are launching is uh, sequ sequential monitoring of the tumor evolution. And we are very excited about technology that we can measure mutations in the blood from DNA so that we can look at the evolution of tumors over time. So that's when it comes to the mutations. Um, the other two areas that are incredibly exciting is the field of immunology. And we have in the audience great immunologists that are doing amazing work with the checkpoint uh, blockade. 
and that's changing. The melanoma is changing in some types of lung cancer. Now, it's not going to help everybody. So a big effort is to identify which are the mutations in those tumors that predict who will respond to immune therapy. And then the last part is uh, the concept of engineered T cells, the notion that you can use um, uh, the T cells from the own patient to um, engineer them uh, ex vivo and uh, manipulate them in a way that they can expand. You can put them back in, and then those T cells, uh, that what they are, they are professional killers, and they have no mercy. Uh, they go in, and they just don't stop until the job is, is done. And that's something that is also very promising. So I think these are the three or four major areas. And I think what defines the moment it's not just the concept, but the tremendous amount of opportunities that we have. So it's, it's mind-boggling to see all these things mm -hmm. coming.